Hey guys, welcome back to Ask a CPA. Today I am here with Russell Wallace, one of my buddies and longtime CPA, great financial advisor and tax expert extraordinaire. <laughs> Thanks for that uh, beautiful introduction there. Bro. Yeah, you got it, man. So today we're going to be talking about some year-end tax planning strategies for individual taxpayers. So these, these strategies, they can be used um, in most situations, but of course, contact your, your personal CPA. Make sure you're walking through these plans with your CPA to make sure that they are applicable to your situation as there are many um, underlying rules and you know, requirements to be able to, to qualify for certain deductions. So um, Russell, you got anything to say? You want to jump right into it? Yeah, no, I think that's great. Be sure and talk to your, your personal CPA or financial advisor for any of this advice, or you could call us. Yeah, of course. Yeah, if you're not working with a CPA, uh, I'll leave Russell's contact information down below along with mine, so feel free to, uh, to reach out if you need some, need some CPA expertise. It, absolutely. <laughs> so let's dive in. All right, so number one, uh, maximize retirement contributions. So I see this a lot when I'm pulling up individual returns and looking at their W-2s. And you say, wow, you know, they, they really hit a home run. They have a high income earners, yeah. but they're not maximizing their retirement contributions. Yeah, that's exactly right. And I think the thing to remember is that you can make a one-time year-end contribution. Every employer allows this. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's not too late. Look at your pay stub, see how much you've contributed, kind of calculate or estimate how much you will contribute by the end of the year and just make a one-time contribution to make up the difference. Right. Yeah, that's a, that's a really good one. I think... Um, you know, you'll look back in 10 or 20 years and really appreciate yourself for, yeah. for making those contributions with the, the compounding um, growth in retirement accounts can be pretty huge. And a lot of employers now offer, you know, a Roth option as well within a 401k or retirement plan. So um, you could probably speak more to this as you, know, you do some financial advising as well. Yeah. And so depending on your age, there's some different uh, kind of thresholds or rules of thumb that you want to follow. But the younger you are, the more, uh, the more beneficial a Roth is, right? So uh, because of that compounding grows tax-free, and then you get to pull it out tax-free. And so uh, the younger you are, the more growth you have, so the more tax-free dollars end up existing there in the Roth. And so, you know, if my kind of rule of thumb is if you're under 40, if you're under 40, definitely a Roth is, is, a, is a wise choice. If you're under 45, uh, probably need to look at a couple things, but probably still going Roth. But not really until you get over 45, maybe even 50, that we're going to go traditional IRA after that. Uh, mm -hmm. But uh, again, you can have a 401k, a traditional IRA, and a Roth IRA. So your unique situation really comes into play here. So you really need some professional advice to get to, to some of the finer details. But overall, the idea here is, is that you want to max out your 401k up to your company match, and then you want right. to max out your IRA or your Roth IRA, and then you want to go back to that 401k to get to that $22,500 limit for 2023. Right. So definitely make sure you're hitting that employer match um, because it's, that's free money, and that's part of your compensation. That yeah. as an employer, when we are hiring somebody, you know, we're thinking – you know, not only their wages, but we're thinking, you know, the self-employment tax that we're having to pay on their behalf, their mm -hmm. retirement contributions, their health insurance. This is all part of their compensation package. Um, so, you know, your employer is considering that part of your compensation package. So make sure you're taking advantage of that, um, you know. In a lot of cases, it's 100% return day one, right? Yeah. Yeah. And especially if you're already vested, if you've already been at your employer a year, two years, three years, whatever that vesting period is. Right. Um, there aren't any many investments out there where day one you get a hundred percent return on them. So right. it's a good thing. Yeah, with our firm we don't we don't have a vesting schedule at all. Like it's hundred percent day one, it's yours. There you go. So we you know, a lot of employers are they really want their employees to contribute to these retirement plans and you know, it's a huge benefit um, and helps Helps recruiting as well. Yeah, absolutely. All right, so let's jump into the next one, harvesting capital losses. So um, this is a big one. You know, work with your financial advisor. So you're allowed to take up to $3,000 of capital losses every year against your ordinary income. Um, but if you have any capital gains as well. So this is just going through your current taxable account inside of your brokerage account. 
and saying, okay, I have any lost positions that I want to get out of. Like, would I, would I repurchase this stock today if, um, if I had this capital in cash? So go into your brokerage account, any lost positions, go ahead and sell those. Um, yeah, I think that's a great strategy. And you should be looking at your investments, you know, especially as we come to year end to just kind of, you know, recategorize some things, move things yeah. around in some buckets and make sure that, that you're properly allocated, um, especially with the market being so volatile as it has been the past few years. Yeah, and if you, especially if you manage the money yourself, uh, if you have a financial advisor, they should be looking at this for right, you. Right. And, and if they're not, you should probably find a new financial advisor. But uh, if you manage the money yourself, a lot of times what will happen is you'll, you'll invest into different stocks or some bucket of stocks, and then it gets to kind of be on autopilot, right? And so it just kind of sits there. You don't think about it. And so it's, it's a good idea around this time of year, every year, to go back and look at those, see which ones, see which investments aren't doing very well, and uh, apply that investment principle that so many, that is smart, that so many people don't. And that is, ask yourself this question for each one of those investments, is if, if that money was sitting in cash, the value of that investment was sitting in cash, would I buy this investment today? Right. Right, that's, that's the key question, right? It's never, you know, if I, if I sell it, I'm, I'm losing money if I sell it, that sort of thing. Well, it's would I buy this investment today at that dollar, uh, that dollar value. And if you would, keep it there. But if not, then, you know, use it to offset some of those other gains that you have in some of your other stock trades. Right. And that kind of brings us to the next point, which is mutual fund distribution. So if you are not owning individual stocks and you're just owning mutual funds, they can kick off capital gains as well, right? That's right. So the turnover rate, that's the thing you want to look for, right, is the turnover rate. And selling those lost positions can help offset some of those capital gains from mutual funds that you have. Uh, but you should be able to log into your account and see what those are to date. Um, and you can also, if you've held a mutual fund for a while, you can kind of see or estimate what those will be for the year end. Uh, but it's a, it's a key thing to look at, especially if you're a high net worth individual where you've got a lot of money invested in, in these, these mutual funds um, instead of individual stocks. And it's a, right. it's a surprise income or phantom income that we like to say in our world where you're paying tax on money that you may have never received. Because we've been talking about the capital gain distributions and tax loss harvesting for stocks, uh, we, we, we'd be remiss if we didn't talk about wash sales. So this is where you can get into a trap if you're like, well, I definitely want to hold that stock, but it's at a loss. I'm going to go ahead and sell it, capture that loss, and then and rebuy it, right? right? right. Um, and so you can't do that. And so you, it, there's, a, uh, there's a waiting period in order for you to be able to do that. And so what you want to make sure that you do is if you're going to sell it to harvest those tax losses, um, you want to make sure that it stays sold, right? You don't want to sell it and then go rebuy it. Right. And, and some place where I see clients have gotten caught before is they'll sell it in a personal account and harvest those tax losses, but buy it in an IRA account or vice versa, right? Mm. And, uh, but what you have to remember is that, it, is that those wash sale rules, they, uh, they go across all of your investments, including IRAs. Right. So you can't sell it personally, capture those losses, then go buy it in your IRA right. at a, well, you know, a perceived discount, right? And so the IRS yeah. has already caught on to you. Right. So with the wash sale, you have to go naked, is what they call it, so without holding that same position for 30 days. So it may be, um, it, this doesn't apply to like mutual funds, it applies to the individual mutual fund, but if you, if you say, you know, you're holding Apple stock and you want to sell Apple stock, you can buy Microsoft or you could buy a mutual fund that's holding mm -hmm. Apple stock, right? You just can't buy that specific stock. Is that correct? That's right. It's one for one, one right. for one. So right. exactly the same mutual fund or exactly the same stock. Right. Um, but you can still keep your allocation. Say you wanted exposure to the tech industry. Exactly. You can still keep that exposure to that industry by going either with the mutual fund or going with another stock that's similar in this in that same in that same industry that has the same exposure um, to that industry. Uh, all right. Now next is Roth conversion. So we've been talking to people about Roth conversions for years. And so this is um, you know, taking your current taxable IRA that maybe you have from an old employer and then, and then triggering a taxable event, which we normally don't like, right? Yeah. So you're creating a taxable event and then you're rolling it or converting that Roth in, or converting that traditional IRA into a Roth IRA. 
Um, you know, what, why would somebody do this? We hate taxable events, right? We don't want to create yeah. a taxable event. So why would somebody do this? And like, who is the ideal person, maybe like age wise as to who yeah. would, who would benefit the most from this? Yeah, it's totally counterintuitive, right? So let's create some phantom income, right? So we're creating income from money you don't receive because it's right. in an IRA. So you can't, uh, you can't touch the money. You can't use the money to pay the taxes from this conversion. Uh, so we're creating phantom income uh, with a taxable event on, on top of it, right? So uh, why would you want to do this? Well, if I have a 401k, if I work for an employer and now I'm self-employed maybe, or if I've got a new job, let's say you get a large year-end bonus or something like that. If mm -hmm. you're 35, if you're 40, and you expect to have sizable retirement income, then uh, in these, in these, tax, in these uh, qualified accounts, IRAs and 401ks, convert that over to a Roth, and now you've, you've basically stopped, uh, effectively what you've done is you've stopped the ability, having to pay taxes on that money ever again. Right. So yes, you get hit with a one-time tax bill, but you don't have to ever pay taxes on that money again. And right. so that's, that's really where it's key. So if you have a business owner, Maybe you, you bought some extra equipment, and so your taxable income is going to be very low this year, but you have this 401k back from when you used to be an employee. Well, now is a great time to convert that money over at this now lower marginal tax rate, where in retirement, you may be in a much higher tax rate, or in future years, you're going to be in a higher tax rate. Go ahead and convert that over. And, um, and this is a good time to note that this year is a, one of the one of the years that we're phasing out bonus depreciation, right? So it's 80%. Mm -hmm. right. And so next year it drops down to 60%. And so now's a great time. If you have these 401ks, start planning today, maybe some equipment or vehicles that you need to buy for your business. Mm -hmm. Take that 80% to bonus depreciation and use that to offset the taxes from this conversion event. And so now it's almost a wash, but now you never have to pay taxes on that retirement account or that qualified account again. Right. I love it. It's a great idea. Um, yeah, Roth conversions are huge. I know I personally have an IRA that I had from an old employer that I wish I had converted over to a Roth <laughs> a few years ago, but now it, it probably doesn't make sense. I'm getting, I'm getting too old. <laughs> you're getting old and you're, and you're just making too much money, bro. Uh, well, that's, I don't know about that, but all right. So the next one's going to be qualified charitable distributions. Yeah. Russell, what do you know about qualified charitable distributions? Well, so it's a great little tax strategy, especially if you have some money that you want to you want to give away to charity. Uh, you don't want to pull that money out and then pay taxes on it and then maybe give it to charity after the fact. So mm -hmm. what you do, you have to be 70 and a half to do this, right? But up to $100,000, you can gift that money directly to a charity from your IRA, and it never comes to you where you have to pay taxes and then and then donate it, right? So instead of, you know, if you did the full $100,000, your high income earner, right? And so instead of contributing, you know, $65,000 after you pay a 35% income tax, you can do the full hundred. So you can kind of maximize that gift, it kind of keeps the government's paws off of it, right? So that's right. what we're all about, right? Yeah. So uh, you keep the government's paws off of that, uh, off of that contribution, and you get to help that charity a little bit more than you could have if you didn't do it this way. The keys there is that it has to come directly from your IRA, right? So you can't mm -hmm. distribute it to you and then to the charity. You got to make the contribution from your IRA directly to the charity. Right. I see this all the time when we look at you know individuals' tax returns, and they have you know charitable contributions that they've made all year, but they don't have a mortgage interest, they don't have property taxes, so they're not itemizing. They're not getting any benefit, any tax benefit from these charitable contributions. Um, and they're taking money out of their retirement plan or they're taking out required minimum distributions mm -hmm. from their retirement plans. And they're not getting any benefit for these gifts. So they're paying tax on the income then they're giving it away and not getting any benefit for it. When they can just skip that whole step and just give it directly out of their retirement plan and... Um, make the charity happy and make you happy because you don't have to pick it up as income. That's right. And this is also where speaking with a CPA or a financial advisor is, is really important because for so long we had such a low standard deduction, right? I think it was like $3,000, $3,500. Mm -hmm. right. And then now all of a sudden it's $12,500, $13,000 per person, right? Mm -hmm. And so uh, a lot of these paradigms that people have had about taxes for so long, hey, I can give this money to charity and I get a tax deduction, sometimes they're not true. So this is where talking to a CPA can be really beneficial because we can help you structure some of these transactions in a more tax efficient way. Right, yeah, that's a great point. Um, so the next one is reviewing your W-2 withholdings. So 
I see this a lot at year end when you when you go through it. Everyone's like, you know, what happened? Why did my why am I paying tax this year, or why do I owe every year? And it's like, well, you're just not withholding enough on your W two. Yeah. It's or either you're receiving a big chunk of your income through bonuses, which are withheld at a lower rate, so you're not compensating for that on your normal withholdings, mm-hmm. um, or you're just simply just not withholding enough. So you need to go through and review that on an annual basis to make sure that you're not under withholding on your W twos. Yeah, that's exactly right. Especially if you work in the finance industry where you have a heavy bonus compensation, at, especially at year end. Mm-hmm. Um, I see that a lot, but uh, that money is generally withheld at a lower rate. And so it's a big surprise. And you don't want that surprise to happen when you finally get around to doing your tax returns August of next year or something like that. Right. You know, Go ahead and get that review done here in November, December, where you still have time to do a catch-up contribution or catch-up payment and eliminate any penalties or anything like that that you might have. That's right. So something that uh, some people don't think about, Brett, is this annual gift exclusion, right? So every year you can give a certain amount of money away. For 2023, it's $17,000 a person. So if it's you and a spouse, you can give up to $34,000 to an individual. Now, where this really comes into play is anytime you're going to give, if you're, if you're older um, and already in retirement, you're going to give money to maybe grandkids, grandkids' college savings, like 529 plans, yeah. things like that. Um, this allows you to give money today uh, when the estate tax is, uh, the estate tax threshold is a little bit higher. So we don't really know what it's going to be in the future. Today, it's almost $13 million a person, which is yeah. really, really high. It's definitely coming down next year. And then, you know, depending on how uh, the, the current administration will be uh, next year being an election year, uh, how Congress is, and all of those negotiations work out, that a state limit, the state exclusion limit could come down significantly. It's been as low as $5 million, I think maybe even $3 million some years. Mm-hmm. And so if that comes down dramatically, uh, then you're going to be really glad you gave that money away when the state limit was higher, right? Right. And so if you, if you have means, if you plan on giving money to heirs uh, when you pass away, uh, you know, when the state limit is higher is a great time to go ahead and do that. And again, mm-hmm. that's $17,000 a person, right? So it's you and your spouse. So that's $34,000 that you can give to any individual. Right. So you and Laura can both give me $17,000 for a total of $34,000 every year. We could. We could. We could. <laughs> It's highly recommended. That you do this. <laughs> it's, it's it's maybe not possible, but it's we could. All right. So the next one's gonna be the donor advised fund. Now you may have heard about this before. I know I've been talking about this to my clients for years. It's a way of bunching your itemized deductions into a single year, um, especially if you're right on the cusp of itemizing yeah. or not. Um, and if you if your income fluctuates a little bit, this definitely helps as well. Do you want to? You want to give us a kind of an update yeah. of what you think the best situation is for a, a donor advised fund? Yeah, and I've had a couple of clients uh, use this to, to a huge advantage. And there, there are a couple of ways to do this. One is if you have kind of a peak and valley income, right? And let's say this year is a peak income year. And you're also someone who likes to give away to charity, right? Mm-hmm. And so right. you give a bunch of money away to charity this year, but do it through a donor advised fund. And then you you kind of stage out those those distributions to charities year after year after year. Mm -hmm. So if you're someone who's giving 10 or 15,000, 20,000 dollars or more to charity each year and you have a peak income year this year, then maybe you put up, you know, 40,000, 50,000 into a donor advised fund. You make sure that you're over that standard deduction threshold, which uh, for 2023, I believe is $27,000 for married filing joint people. Mm-hmm. Uh, so make sure that you get over that and uh, and you get that big deduction in a year that you have larger income. And then you get to give that money out um, periodically over the next two, three or four years, five years, whatever it happens to be. Right. Now, the other way that this is really beneficial is if you're somebody who does like to give away money to charity, and let's say you've held on to some land or a rental property for a long time, and, uh, and it's really accumulated in value. So one of the things that you can do is you can gift that property over to a donor advised fund um, before you sell it. So this has, it has to be before you have a contract. So there's right. some stipulations there, so be sure you talk to your CPA, but uh, you gift that over to this donor advised fund and then you sell it. Well, that whole 
uh, the whole profit from that transaction now goes into the donor advised fund. And so now you get a, a charitable dot distribute a charitable deduction for that at uh, fair market, at value, fair market right? value. Yep. That's right. And then uh, and then that money then then once that property sells, that cash goes into the fund. It sits in a in a mutual fund or some other kind of ETF general market uh, vehicle. And uh, as it grows, your charitable your charitable contribute your charitable gift to people grows. You've already taken the deduction in a high income year, and you get to give that money out over time, whether it be church or um, your favorite you know, homeless shelter or animal shelter or whatever it happens to be, mm -hmm. um, you get to give that money out consistently year over year in a 10, 15, 20, $30,000 gift. Right. I've had clients do this as much as uh, almost $1.4 million. So they had a piece of land, they gifted to the charity, they were able to put $1.4 million into this charitable gift fund, this donor advised fund. They took wow. a huge deduction, yeah. happened to be the same year that they were selling a business. So they're gonna have a peak tax year, right? Yeah. And so they were able to use that full deduction amount in that year. But even if you're not able to use it in the year that you give that money to the donor advised fund, um, it, it, you use whatever you can up to the 50% limit, right? 50% of AGI, of AGI that's right. right. And, uh, but then it carries over year after year until you've used it all up. So even if you don't think your income is gonna be high enough, but you have an opportunity to, to set up a donor advised fund, yeah. you, can, you can go ahead and do it and that, that deduction just carries over year after year. Right, love it. And we see a lot of com people do this as well if they have stocks, like if they've received stock options from a company mm -hmm. for a long period of time, and they have you know, a very small basis in these stocks that have appreciated you know, significantly in value. Instead of creating a big taxable event, selling that stock at a huge gain, paying capital gains on that, mm -hmm. and then contributing to a charity, you can just contribute that stock directly to a donor advised fund or you know if, even if you don't do the donor advised fund you can still contribute that stock directly to a charity That's not right. have to pay capital gains on the transaction and take the deduction at fair market value so that's yeah that's a great point and yeah. a really good tool that um that a lot of clients aren't aware of but should be i mean that's that's a huge planning opportunity. Absolutely, absolutely. And charities understand how to do this, right? Because right, they, they right. want to get these, yeah. they have people come to them before. Yeah. So they've worked all this out for you. So if you have a favorite charity, just go talk to them. If you want to do this, go talk to them. And they're going to be able to walk you through that process. Absolutely. And work with your CPA. Have them draw it out and say, you know, if I contribute $50,000 to a donor advice fund this year, like what is the benefit of that? Or how? what's the... What's the range that I should be thinking of as far as a charitable contribution goes in a year? Um, and you know, how many years could I give that out? It's kind of, not only that, and you also wanna think about, this is the year you're gonna be taking all of your itemized deductions. So if you're gonna make any non-cash charitable contributions to like Goodwill, you wanna do that in the same year as well, right? Cause that's the year that you're gonna be itemizing. And then going forward, you're just gonna be taking the standard deduction until you either re-contribute to the donor advised fund or, you know, you, you, you expense everything out of the donor advice fund mm -hmm. and now you're just taking, you know, you're, you're back on the normal charitable contributions. Um, Absolutely. You're giving your CPA a chance to nerd out in Excel, right? Right. And we, and we really love that. <laughs> oh, so, we love it. Yeah. So, so be sure and, and talk to your CPA. Give them an opportunity to, to do this planning for you so you know exactly what's going to happen yeah. um, and, and kind of model out year after year what this effect, this total taxable effect is going to be. Right. And I think you're going to be pleasantly surprised. Yeah, absolutely. All right, so the next one is 529 plans. So if you have you know, children or grandchildren who um, are you know, on their way up and haven't yet gone to college yet, but you think that they've got a bright future, <laughs> you know, uh, let's go ahead and contribute funds to a 529 plan. They will grow tax deferred, meaning you don't pay taxable income on any of the growth within that fund as, as it accumulates. Um, and then as long as the proceeds are used for qualified education expenses, mm -hmm. you're not paying tax on any of that growth over the years. So this is a huge, huge opportunity for people um, to contribute to these plans. I know it's been kicked around. I don't think it's passed yet, but they've kicked around the idea of being able to any unused 529 plans to roll them into a Roth. I wow. don't know if you've heard about that. Uh, no. I don't think it's passed yet, but I know a lot of people have, have you know, proposed that idea. So I wouldn't be surprised if that doesn't pass you know, in, in, the, in the coming years. 
Um, yeah. But yeah, 529 plants are, are fantastic. Yeah, and so they're transferable to, right. to kids, yeah. right, to other kids. And so, uh, um, so that's great. But if you're able to then roll those over into an IRA, I mean, to me, that makes perfect sense. And I would mm -hmm. definitely um, see how that could come into play uh, later on and uh, hopefully sooner rather than later. But uh, especially if they do that, then I, that would be, that makes the 529 even a better vehicle. Right. Uh, but from estate planning, you know, if you're up there in age and you're trying to give away uh, some money, so we talked about this earlier, where you can give away that money, gift that money as grandparents or, or aunts and uncles, different things like that. You can gift this money to those to those children when they're when they're young or or even older, give that money a chance to grow a little bit and compound, get kind of maximum benefit for those dollars. Right. And it's really a great plan, a great yeah. plan. And then it can transfer from kid to kid to kid, kind of down that down that age bracket. Mm -hmm. um, really a great chance to leave a, a lasting legacy. Absolutely, yeah. I think five twenty nine plans are fantastic. I recommend them to all my all my clients with children, um, you know, especially in this higher income, you know most of their kids are, are going to be attending college or yeah. you know we, we all hope we we, yeah, all hope. we all hope we all hope who knows with uh with the cost of college you know maybe maybe nobody will be able to afford yeah, college at some point only those people with 529 plans that, yeah that's probably right um uh, and then so the the next year in planning tax tip is for higher education tax uh credits so if your kids are already in college or if you're a student in college uh, there's two different ways to take tax credits on uh, your personal tax return. And I've done a video on this before, uh, but we'll just real quickly touch on these. It's the American Opportunity Tax Credit and the Lifetime Learning Credit. Um, both are, are, are great tax credits. Um, there's different qualifications and different income limitations on each, but um, if you have any higher education expenses, you definitely want to take this mm -hmm. into account as you're you know, as we come to year end, you're kind of calculating what you think your your tax liability is going to look like. Yeah, and where a CPA really comes in to help here is that um, there's always this kind of conversation, especially if the college student works, right? So who should take the credit? Right. The parent right. or the child. Um, there's some income exclusions there you have to think about. Um, and so if the child has some earned income and maybe isn't a dependent because uh, you don't get as much of a, of, a, of a tax benefit for dependents anymore, mm -hmm. especially if you're higher income. So um, there's, some, there's some planning opportunities that you really need to talk to your CPA about. And doing it this year, especially if you're a business owner, is, uh, is wise, right? right? So there's some opportunities there. Maybe your, your student can, give, can do some work for your business, get some earned income, claim the opportunity tax credit, right? And so right. there's a lot of things there that, um, that uh, uh, as we like to say, provide more value than what we charge. And so uh, some great opportunities there where you're gonna get more tax value, more tax credits out of, out of anything that a CPA would charge for the year in tax planning. This would just be a small piece of that year in planning. So it's a great reason to just get in there, uh, make that appointment and, and get that planning done. Right, that's a, that's a great point. All right, so the last um, tax planning tip for 2023 tax year is the electric vehicle tax credit so yeah. i recently bought a tesla love it highly recommend uh purchasing one russell what do you think about uh electric vehicle tax credits I think this is a this is a one that everyone should do or yeah i think it's great i think it's great so not only do you need to feel good about helping out the environment and uh doing kind of your part there but also right. you get some great tax savings so up to $7,500. Uh, there are some limitations about which vehicles um, up, can, you can apply to the tax credit, right? So they have to be you know, assembled here in the US and all of that, but there's a list that the IRS publishes. And so right. uh, the automakers definitely know, can guide you right. to which vehicles yeah, yeah, are on absolutely. that list. But um, so I think the limit is somewhere around $50,000, $55,000 for a car, $80,000 for an SUV. Um, but the $7,500 tax credit really reduces that initial cost of ownership. Mm -hmm. So if you have under $300,000 of AGI for married filing joint, um, and you're gonna owe some taxes, this is a key here. You gotta make sure that you're gonna owe some taxes because this is one of those few credits that doesn't carry over year to year. So right. it's use it or right. lose it. Use it or lose it. Yeah, so before you go out and buy a car, be sure you talk to your CPA, make sure that you're gonna meet the, the income threshold and make sure you're gonna meet the tax, taxable liability threshold before you go out and do that. But as long as you meet those two thresholds, it's a great opportunity to get into a new car right before Christmas. Right, absolutely, I highly recommend them. I bought a um, Model 3 
Man, it's zippy. It's zippy, guys. I yeah. like it. Um, my wife took it out last night and forgot to charge it when she got home. So I was driving our daughter to school this morning, and it was like 30% battery left. Oh, <laughs> oh man. man. Oh, so man. I had to go find a, uh, one of those superchargers, plug there it in, go. and get it juiced up. Um, but yeah, I love I love the electric vehicle, and I think it's a it's a you know awesome tax credit and a huge incentive. I would have bought one without the credit, but um, you know adding seventy five hundred bucks on definitely definitely helps. Yeah, that's really great. You know, and that infrastructure is getting better and better and right. better, and so. Uh, you know, pretty soon it'll be as ubiquitous as gas stations and things like that. Uh, your place of work will have them. They already do have them in some places, right? So right. Um, it's a great it's a great tax credit. All right, guys. So that's it. That's your 2023 yeah. year-end tax planning strategies for individuals. Russell, I really appreciate you jumping yeah. on here with me. Hopefully, we'll do a bunch more of these. If you guys enjoy it, give it a big thumbs up and make sure you hit that subscribe button down below. The channel's growing really quickly and. Uh, we appreciate everyone watching. Yeah, thanks so much, Brett. Happy to be here. And uh, hopefully uh, your viewers have gotten and your subscribers have gotten some, some good information. I bet they have, yeah, for sure. Well, thanks a lot, guys, and we'll see you in the next video. Take care.